All right, good morning, everyone. Can you all see the flyer? Just give me a nod or a heads up. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay. All right, so welcome to our first virtual 2020 um, Psych Sign Region 2 conference. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Great, all right. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, just wanna start by wishing everyone a good morning and um, welcoming you once again. I know it's early in the morning and thank you for dedicating your Saturday to show up. So my name is Tammy Kim and I'm your Region 2 Chair. I'll be graduating from Torocom, New York and starting my psychiatry residency at Zucker School of Medicine Northwell this summer. Um, and I also like to introduce Shreya Basin and Damian Pizarro, our local, local psych sig leaders at University of Rochester School of Medicine and CUNY School of Medicine, respectively. They'll be closely involved in monitoring today's events, so please message any one of us for help throughout the day. Um, I see some familiar faces today, so I'd like to start by thanking you all for your interest, uh, be it newfound or continued in psych sign. Um, a little background about us, we at the psych Psychiatry Student Interest Group Network, our national network aiming to connect students with the shared interest of pursuing careers in psychiatry and aiding in this pursuit. Uh, we currently serve eight regions encapsulating the 52 states and territories, 10 Canadian provinces and international regions, and in New York State alone, we have 300 members. So despite the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been working hard to ensure that medical students who feel passionately about psychiatry, like ourselves, can still engage in opportunities and experiences that broaden our knowledge base and connect with the community of psychiatry and mental health at large. Among our services are the mentorship program, wellness and burnout prevention, AMA, medical student section delegation, forum events, and the alumni network. Today, we plan to continue these efforts by encouraging empathy, awareness, and championing health equity, as well as by providing guidance to those who plan on applying to psychiatry res residency programs. And so we hope you find today informative and helpful. Uh, before turning over the floor to our first honored speaker, I'll quickly review our schedule and some housekeeping. Okay, so um, everybody can see the flyer still, right? Okay, great. So um, after um, today's opening remarks, um, we'll launch into our first speaker session with Dr. Sonia Varani, um, internet use in the COVID-19 pandemic, the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, from there, we'll move on to our second session with Dr. Jonathan Avery, uh, dealing with addiction in the medical community. And then from there, uh, the third speaker session will deal with human trafficking and um, training in healthcare. We'll take a lunch break for about an hour at the midpoint. Um, and then at 2.30, uh, I should say Eastern time, because I know some of you are dialing in um, internationally and from other time zones. Um, at 2.30, we'll continue with um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, uh, New York City's um, presentation in our own voice. And then from there, we'll move into the last segment of the conference, the residency workshop. Okay. Um, and now, finally, I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Sonia Varani. Uh, she is an addiction psychiatry fellow at Yale University, a 2021 Laughlin Fellow of the American College of Psychiatrists, RFM trustee elect on the APA's Board of Trustees. And she will also be a forensic psychiatry fellow at Brown University this coming year. She'll be speaking on internet use on the COVID-19 pandemic, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, thank you and over to you, Dr. Varani. Thank you so much, Tammy. Um, can I share my screen, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Stop sharing, and then I've enabled you to share your screen. Thank you. All right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Tammy, for inviting me here today. Um, I'm so glad this is a uh, a smaller group so we can obviously have some interaction and uh, you know I, I i wanted to take a moment to introduce myself and thank you tammy for uh, <laughs> for for that introduction um but i am from i'm currently at the yale university school of medicine i'm an addiction psychiatry fellow like tammy was saying um but i wanted to take this opportunity to just tell you guys about my journey um, as I, I'm, I'm sitting here joining this conference from Mumbai, actually, uh, I'm visiting home um, at this time of the year. And as I speak, it's actually the sunset behind me. This is all a fake background, but uh, it's a beautiful sunset behind me. 
and it's a very nostalgic time of the year for me. Uh, haven't been home in two and a half years, but uh, this is what yesterday's sunset looked like, right the way. Um, anyway, I just wanted to tell you guys about my journey from um, Mumbai to Minneapolis, then to New York, and then to New Haven, and then Providence, where I'll be going next year. Um, so I started out, I had, I've had the privilege of calling the city my home for the first 25 years of my life, where I also went to high school, college, medical school. I just stayed here in Mumbai all of the time. Um, and then after graduating from medical school, I just I just developed the sense of deep discord and disillusionment uh, with the whole healthcare system in India, um, and especially how residency programs were so limited in their scope um, and potential to train people to serve far and wide. Um, I decided that I just wanted to do something in the beyond beyond one to one patient care. So I applied to a bunch of fellowships. Uh, I'm sorry, not fellowships, scholarships, and did some of the math and then ended up uh, figuring out that the University of Minnesota was actually the more economically stable option for me at the time. And of course, I didn't do my research about how cold Minnesota was. OK, like I really <laughs> this was in August 2013. Um, and I simply took off, I, you know, I just wanted to be in a new place. I had no plans. Of course, I didn't know how psychiatry was practiced. None, none of that stuff, none of that. Um, so anyway, let me tell you what, what, how I've made that journey. So I ended up in the University of Minnesota um, trying to do public health in administration and policy, just, you know, to di diverge a little bit from what medical school's monotony was. Um, Alongside, I was also working with uh, the Be The Match National Marrow Donor Program. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but it is, I see some of you nodding your head, which is great. Um, so it is, um, you know, it, it runs the largest registry in America for um, stem cell transplantation, donor registry, basically, to match donors and recipients. So I used to work there while at grad school, just a very underpaid uh, <laughs> research assistant. And of course, um, you know, as, as time went by, I realized I needed to do something more to have more stability in the country. And obviously medical training just didn't seem complete without having a license to practice. Uh, but that was at the back of my mind the entire time. Um, and I, like an underpaid graduate research assistant, obviously I was scouring for more jobs everywhere. So one day I ended up in, uh, in the library and then in the sixth floor lab of my, of, of my future boss at the time and he had this you know it was a ten dollar per hour position that was advertised on the elevator and it happened to be a psychiatry uh, lab for neurosciences and uh, and imaging brain imaging basically now currently I, I understand that he's the chief of psychiatry at the va in san antonio so anyway i took up that job and that opened me up to the world of psychiatry for the first time um, and i realized what a wonderful fantastic just fascinating field it is and I, I you know that I started to understand there was things about brain imaging cognitive neuroscience and it was not just about talking to patients and listening to their stories there was a whole you know scientific evidence behind it and things like that anyway I needed some more time to do my exams and stuff and keep up my skills with data analysis so I went to Seattle I found a job at the Fred Hutch which um, maybe some of you have heard of again this was related to my work in uh, bone marrow transplant and a little bit with HIV vaccines research. So I did that, a data management job um, for some clinical trials that they used to run in South Africa. Um, alongside, I was taking my exams and then I ended up matching into New York's Maimonides Medical Center's psychiatry residency program in 2016. Uh, then I spent four years in New York and that's how I came to realize that the country is divided into regions and this is in region two. Um, so anyway, it was, it was quite the privilege, obviously, to train at such a large institution and also the fact that APA, you know, I, I found that several residents and um, attendings, etc., were heavily involved in the APA from district branch levels to all the way up to the board of trustees, etc. Um, so I served on the assembly for a couple of years in my third and fourth year, um, while in, in residency at Maimonides, obviously, and then I, and then there was another election for the board of trustees for an RFM spot, which I, which I ran and, and I won. So <clears throat> now I'm in my first year of that fellowship plan that I made, the two-year fellowship plan. I'm at Yale primarily employed um, at the VA. Um, 
with affiliated to the Yale University School of Medicine. And next year, I'll go over to Brown for my forensic fellowship. And then after all these years, I will be done with training, finally. <laughs> so that's my journey. Um, all right. Uh, if you so let's just start out with I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to you guys today about something that I've been reading about for a long time and I have deep research interests in um, the whole idea of addiction to the internet and different forms of internet addiction. Um, although there is very little that's known um, scientifically researched and written about this topic, it's certainly gaining more popularity because of the pandemic and things that have happened in the recent, you know, recent, recent course of time. Um, so with this, so in today's presentation, and by the way, before I, and this is a small group, so this is great. And if you guys have burning questions, obviously, please feel free to stop me. If you put up your hands, I might not be able to see it. If you put stuff in the chat box, I won't either. Uh, so just feel free to shout out or something, ask me to stop, whatever is unclear, I'm happy to explain as best as I can. So with that, um, here's what I wish to do in today's talk. Um, I want to be able to describe to you guys what a case, um, and this is a case that I've picked up from all of my literature search, et cetera, and working with some of my mentors here at Yale, a case of um, uh, the problematic internet use, the most problematic form of internet use, uh, pornography and its course and management options. I also want to be able to talk about a little bit about the outline of um, the neurobiology, the genetics, what's going on with research in America and elsewhere, uh, what's happening with the diagnostic criteria establishment and different forms of internet addiction, how do they line up against uh, pornography use. And finally, I want to be able to discuss how COVID-19 obviously has fueled internet addiction, especially the use of pornography. So with that, let me first introduce you. I want to tell you the story of, or the case rather, of Mr. Jones and all credits to uh, Drs. Brand, Bleicher, and Potenza, Dr. Potenza here at Yale, um, who published this case in Psychiatric Times. And I found to be rather compelling to use as an example and just you know have us go through the whole um, theoretical aspect of pornography use. So this guy, Mr. Jones, as described in their case, let me just um, you know tell you a little bit about him. So he was a, he has a 26 year history of problematic pornography use and paying for sex during times of stress, um, untreated compulsive sexual behaviors, damaged trust, leading to sexual disconnection and contributed to a divorce. So that's his background. Now in his 30s, he sought treatment twice. Some things will generally jump out at you. Um, just I'm trying to give you an overall background of, of how how people have responded in the recent past to patients approaching them with that kind of problem. So sought treatment twice to address the concerns of po problematic pornography use about which he started to feel guilty and wondered whether it was interfering with situational sexual functioning with his first wife. He met with therapists who minimized his distress and normalized his pornography use. Then um, without concerns being addressed, there were obviously negative consequences and they became more severe. Um, at the age of 37, he was compelled to enter into couples therapy with his first wife. And however, again, this time it was not, not fully addressed. Um, this obviously did not take any responsibility for his contribution to the problems. And this resulted in his marriage uh, breaking down basically at the age of 38, he was divorced and then remarried after four years. Again, the problem started resurfacing. So in his current marriage, he continued his past patterns of behaviors that directed his sexual energy and attention to secret pornography use. It just got a little, um, little more intense. And despite a commitment to himself, to, to himself and to his wife to stop, he was just unable. Uh, finally, this all uh, translated into into more negative consequences because simply because this this was no longer the same stuff was no longer pleasurable or stimulating as it had been in the past, um, and his use of pornography just escalated to a more extreme uh, use of sexually explicit content, um, and so he started to engage in risky sexual behaviors, including viewing pornography at work hours and sexting with a staff member at work, and crossed all professional boundaries, resulting in a sexual misconduct violation. At the age of 47. Now he's five years into the second marriage um, and has this violation, obviously. Um, he experienced, the, he has all of these compulsive sexual behaviors ongoing and finally he enters mindfulness-based treatment for what we call now CSBD or compulsive sexual behavior disorder. 
So this is, I just wanted to show you the trajectory of this one case that they described from start to finish. Um, with that, let me take you over what, what I'm hoping to discuss in this presentation explicitly. So first of all, the definition and facts of problematic use of, in, of the internet. What is the neurobiology, like I was mentioning, the evidence-based models for it and the genetics behind it? Uh, what is happening with this research across the world, the current status and future priorities? What is known about porn addiction specifically? What are the diagnostic conceptualizations based on etio etiopathology? And then there is this whole ongoing debate about defining diagnostic criteria, what is already established and what is left to be ironed out, all of those things I wanna be able to summarize for you. Uh, what are the potential risk factors and clinical manifestations and impact of problematic pornography use? Also the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, what are the assessment tools that are out there to measure this since we don't know a whole lot about this anyway? Uh, broad management in terms of psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy the course and management of this particular case, um, the prevention and harm reduction strategies in the post COVID-19 pandemic era, um, considerations for consumptions of illegal content online. It would make a plea if I didn't touch on that, certainly. Um, and finally, we'll wrap it up at that. All right, so what is, so by the way, internet, and I'm gonna use these terms interchangeably throughout the presentation because um, that's how it is all over the literature. Uh, people use it in different ways. It's problematic use of the internet, problematic internet use, internet addiction, et cetera. There are so many terms. So what is internet addiction as defined by, you know, I picked this up is the most comprehensive definition from one of the papers I was reading. So it talks about this being a psychological dependence on the internet and is, dis and is characterized by excessive or poorly controlled preoccupations, urges, or behaviors regarding internet use uh, leading to impairment or distress. For anything addiction related, it has to be, in order to be classified as a disorder, there has to be some associated impairment or distress. That's like the gold standard thing. Um, now, two discrete manifestations of this. Now, it's broadly categorized into two types, the generalized form and the specific form. So in the generalized form, it's just non-specific. It is a multifaceted overuse of the internet, not related to any one activity. But the specific use is more like a pathological indulgence in one type of the use of internet, the most popular one obviously being pornography. So what are the different types of internet addictions that people have come to, um, researchers have, have, have categorized under the umbrella term? So Young et al. Has done like, have done extensive research in this area and five main problematic areas come out to be. So what are they? Cyber sexual addiction, cyber relationship addiction, which is separate, and they, you know, within that, they try to lump social media, chat rooms, email, et cetera. Uh, net compulsions, which is pertaining to online trading and shopping. Information overload, which is compulsive web surfing for news articles. Uh, something synonymous with the term, which we today known as doom scrolling because of the COVID-19 pandemic, just your wish to know exactly what bad is happening out in the world and you just can't control yourself from doing that. And computer and gaming addiction, which we all are sort of more familiar with, especially in America. Um, so what are, what are some of the facts that people should be aware of at this point? Prevalence rates are very hard to estimate, obviously, you know, for, for obvious reasons. It, and people say it, it can range from anywhere between 0.6 to over 22%. Um, one, thing, one thing to note here is that for the longest time ever, various researchers have tried to show the intersection between internet addiction and various other types of psychiatric disorders. So 100% of studies uh, showing internet addiction overlaps with ADHD, 100% of them. So there's like that much of a correlation. Um, for studies related to depression, OCD, and anxiety, you can see the percentages here, 75, 60, and 57. So a lot of overlap there. Um, as you would imagine, men and women, now one thing I didn't know, men and women would be more equally likely to exhibit internet addiction symptoms broadly, but women obviously have, as you would guess, probably have more difficulties relating to social networking sites. Um, we're moving on to the neurobiology a little bit, and this is more about the genetics part of it. I'll get to the neurobiology in a bit. So um, people have tried to study the heritability estimates all over the world, actually. Um, and while it is 58% for females and 66 for males, there is a whole lot of variance attributable to unique environmental influences, as you could guess. 
and there's a Turkish study again, which shows the genetic influences are so variable, even within twin pairs, ranging from 19 to 86%. And then there was another study in the Netherlands, which was showing 48. Brisbane showed about 41. Um, and then 784 German twins being studied. Um, it could not basically generalize PUI could not could be explained by shared and non shared environmental factors while genetic influence was not found to play any significant role. So the data regarding genetic genetic herit heritability of internet addiction is just all over the place. Uh, there is so much more research to be done in this area. But here, this again, so Feinberg uh, et al. are like a group of researchers which have done a lot of work in this area. And this is just simply a map that is showing you um, in, a, in a pictorial format, uh, the percentage of heritability that I was just telling you on the previous slide. So the darkest blue here is Turkey, which is in the 66 to the 86% bracket. And the rest of the stuff you can see Australia, um, China, Russia, all of that. There's, it's all very variable. There's nothing more to glean from this slide other than the fact that a huge variability exists across the world. And America is totally lagging behind on even doing studies in this area, is what I found from my research. So going to uh, the neurobiology of this stuff. Now, um, something to remember is that the TAC1A1 allele of the dopamine transporter gene, this is the dopamine transporter gene, by the way, and homozygosity of the short allelic variant of the 5-HTTLPR gene have been associated. Now, these are obviously alphabets, uh, but you know, just something that pops up maybe in the future, you could just relate it to just the dopamine transporters prominent everywhere. Um, and that's what makes it one of the forms of addiction because it is very much based on the reward mechanism and the dopamine transporter that functions for substance use disorders also functions in the same way for internet addictions. There's like a whole lot of overlap. So with that, they developed this reward deficiency theory, which, which says that the hypoactive reward systems in the striatum and the prefrontal cortex require stronger stimuli such as drugs or gambling for activation. Um, and then compared to controls, uh, now this thing also, there's reduction in the gray matter volume and white matter abnormalities. But again, as you can even see from the text here, there's obviously very little that people can tell. There's, there's all kinds of you know, things talking about how much smaller um, the corpus callosum or the cingulum or the occipital fascicle becomes, but nothing more, nothing to the extent of knowing how much we know about substance use disorder, certainly, even though the mechanisms are almost similar. Now here, there is this whole thing about, um, so this is how they intersect, right? The addiction model. And by the way, one thing to note is that America uh, bases its diagnostic criteria for this problem and just the whole understanding of the concept based on how similar it is to uh, substance use disorders addiction. Um, so there is this whole concept about a supranormal stimulus when um, obviously you require more than that particular stimulus suddenly becomes not enough anymore. And then you continue to need uh, something over and beyond that as the addiction becomes more intense. Uh, major brain changes in the substance addicts obviously lays the groundwork for research in all of these addictive behaviors. And by the way, from whatever I read in historically too, it sounds like uh, behavioral addictions just came a whole lot before substance use disorders even came to be. And anyway, now the, it's it's like reverse with the whole brain changes and substance addicts laying down the framework for this kind of research in terms of sensitization, desensitization. There is a dysfunctional prefrontal cortex and there is a malfunctioning stress system. So without going too much into that, and if you wish, I could obviously provide more data and more papers if anyone, any one of you want to reach out to me, if you're interested, I certainly can. Now, Europe, on the other hand, has made a lot of progress in this area. They have formed what is known as an integrated, like a conglomeration of various countries. It's called the COST, the Cooperation in Science and Technology Countries. And it's not just for internet addiction and such. It's just a group of like, you know, they, there's a group of professionals from different areas of different walks of life, biotechnology, medicine, information, data, et cetera, computer science, you name it. So these countries come together and conduct research in these areas. One of the prominent areas of research is internet addiction. So there are 38 member countries, one partner country, and one cooperating member. Um, the cooperating member, I think, is Israel, and that the rest of the countries are obviously all in Europe. You can see that the Greens are the observer countries only, so they haven't made that much of headway compared to Europe in, in um, research in this area. Again, Feinberg et al. Uh, is the group of researchers that's prominent in this space. 
Um, now, what is it that they have defined for us as key research priorities to advance understanding of PUI? So one thing is people need a consensus driven conceptualization of this problem to begin with. There has to be age and culturally appropriate assessment instruments. As you can imagine, there is variability all over the world in terms of how culturally this problem is perceived or how, how normal it is to engage in, in such behavior and to what extent. Um, so how would you, given that, uh, be able to diagnose and even measure severity of different forms of PUI? Um, one thing is needed to characterize the, different, the impacts of different forms and just define clinical courses. Um, to reduce obstacles to timely recognition and interventions, just gauging how the nature of the problem, that would be a very difficult thing, certainly. Clarify possible roles of uh, genetics and personality features. Consider the impact of social factors, um, I would say even environmental factors. Generate and validate effective interventions and identify biomarkers. Biomarkers and digital markers certainly have made their way into so many different psychiatric disorders, there is room to do that kind of research with the UI as well. Now, what do we know about porn addiction? The fact that it is, uh, it's like, a, this is this is the triple A engine model. Um, it's, it's also called the problematic consumption model, which talks about how porn, porn addiction is basically, um, divide, it, it goes around like in a circle with these three interrelated problems. One of impaired control, um, just, you know, having craving, unsuccessful attempts to reduce the behavior and impairment overall of social and other, other kinds of functioning, narrowing of interests and neglect in other areas of life and risky use, persisting intake despite awareness of damaging psychological effects or even the consequences like job loss, relationship breakdowns, etc. So that's what we know. I bring it back to, to Mr. Jones's case. And I wanted to do a little bit of an interactive activity with you guys if you're up for it. I'm just quickly going to go through it once more just so that you have a summary of it and you haven't forgotten because the question that follows, you'll understand why I did this. So, you know, this guy, he developed all this, you know, in his 30s, he had um, this situational sexual functioning. He met with therapists, et cetera, who minimized his distress. Um, you know, he had uh, over the next three years, it became more severe of a problem. He entered couples therapy that didn't help him very much. He didn't take any responsibility. Relationship breakdown occurred, remarried at 42. Um, then he directed his attention to secret use despite a commitment, so obviously not able to stop. And then because it was no longer pleasurable stimulus, more explicit content was being utilized, uh, risky behaviors, etc. And then finally at 47, misconduct violation. And then finally he entered treatment. So with this, if you could just take your phones out for a brief bit um, and go to www.menti.com, I want you to tell me right into this word cloud using this code, uh, what are the various things that, uh, you know, information uh, points in this case that, that gave you the idea that this was problematic online pornography use or CSPD. We'll take about two minutes to do that. Let me know if this link isn't working or there is some other problem, okay? Right. I'm not seeing any uh, stuff pop up. I don't know if you guys are typing or can anybody just tell me if you are? I'm okay. typing right now, Dr. Veroni. Okay, okay, cool. Sorry. I just wanted to know <laughs> that it's working. That's all. Sure. Feel free to unmute you guys um, if you want to interact with Dr. Veroni and answer your questions yeah, as well. If I'm speaking too much, guys, stop me. This is a smaller group. <laughs> uh, so yeah, go ahead and put this stuff into the cloud. Okay, I have one. You know, I'll stop sharing the previous screen and give you the word cloud so that you can see what's coming up. Here it goes. Can you see it? Okay. So here we have unable to stop, not pleasurable, increasingly explicit, concerns from spouse, secret use, very good. Everyone's picking on different things, which is nice. Sexual misconduct violation, certainly. Oh, there's a lot here. Not not inter, in, intimate is probably what somebody wanted to say. Minimized, 
um, okay, increasingly explicit, progressively more, unable to stop, awesome. Compulsive behavior, issues lasting 20 years, somebody's done the math, this is awesome, <laughs> this is great. Uh, risky behavior, sexual dysfunction, divorce, sneaking around, uh, yeah, I think I covered it all. You guys are, thank you for participating. So we know a lot of people have said secret use. Oh, there, some more is coming up. What else do we have? Still going, sneaking around, sexual misconduct, violation, issues lasting 20 years, lack of therapeutic support. I'm so glad somebody finally said that. Lack of therapeutic support. Although that won't really play out into defined, like diagnostic criteria is not dependent upon the treatment that you get. I'm just glad that somebody identified it. Um, okay, social concern. That's the new one. Difficulty stopping you, certainly. All right, let's stop this for now and return to the presentation. Thank you guys for participating. You are great. Um, okay. Going back, where were we now? All right. Do you see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. So let me, so that was great. So you have an idea about what goes, what should go. In your mind, you have an idea of what should go into the diagnostic conceptualization. So Kafka was a researcher in MGH, not so long ago, tried, tried to propose to the APA to include, um, you know, problematic pornography use and compulsive sexual behavior as uh, one of the things in the DSM-5, and he based his uh, his whole set of criteria on the on the following, like on hypersexual behavior, on the fact that somebody had to be sexually motivated. It is more of a behavioral addiction. He also tried to purport that it could be a part of the obsessive compulsive spectrum uh, disorder, which by the way, you know, in a way this is, you know, an obsession and a compulsion, but this differs a little bit from OCD based on the whole positive and negative reinforcement thing. So for an OCD, certainly the compulsions are more along the lines of a negative reinforcement, but here in pornography use that difference is there. It's more like a positive reinforcement, which is why the whole co content becomes more explicit. The frequency becomes more excess. So you should know about that one differential point. Um, impulsive, impulsive, um, impulsivity spectrum disorders. They tried to fit it in there too, uh, instead of creating a chapter of their own. And then another one is out of control, excessive sexual behavior. So he had these five things where he could say it needed a set of criteria of its own. So and then they rejected it completely and did not wish to make it a part of APS DSM-5 at all, just based on the fact that there was very limited neuro, neuroimaging evidence collected over the neuroimaging and behavioral evidence. Certainly you can't just go about, you know, conducting clinical trials on people with this problem. Um, so that's what happened. And, and that died down for a while until of course COVID came to be. Now there is an ongoing debate about diagnostic criteria out there. So what are the issues mainly in this area? One thing is this, as you can imagine, this issue is not just about a diagnostic definition or a diagnostic criteria. There's a whole lot of things. There's a whole industry that's, that's you know, the whole pornography industry plus like other types of, you know, peripheral industries that are contributing or just have a hand to play in all of this. So you could imagine there could be also the whole idea of a pathologizing something that is a very integral aspect of human behavior has been the most important like point of discussion in this whole debate. So, and also there is potential for forensic abuse of hypersexual disorder, as you would imagine, like where would you draw the line is the question. So mental illness and pathologizing sexuality, certainly, and discounting by di dissecting diagnosis, like at what point are you going to say what is normal versus not and which symptom is overdone versus which one is actually within the normal range of appropriately accepted cultural behavior all across America. So you can understand that you know the scope of this problem is certainly very large. The ICD-11, however, which is more utilized in other parts of the world has made a lot more progress in this area. So there are guidelines, which however, the ICD-11 has its own disclaimer, which says that the CSBD, which they're calling, by the way, problematic on online pornography use is more in the context of DSM-5, but CSBD, compulsive sexual behavior disorder is more for the ICD-11. Although I use these terms interchangeably a lot, so ICD-11 prefaces this saying that it should not be used 
uh, should not be diagnosed based on distress related to moral judgments or disapproval about sexual impulses, urges, or behaviors that would otherwise not be considered indicative of psychopathology. Also, the one important question is, are we putting the cart before the horse? Because does our health system really have all of the resources and the amount of knowledge and the kinds of treatments available? It's not just about defining the diagnostic criteria, right? So what is going to be accomplished by even defining it? Is the system able to support what is needed to, to tackle it at this point? And certainly the answer to that is no, because very little is known even about this. So. Um, then again, you know, they go back and forth about conceptualizing it as an impulse control disorder, even in the ICD-11. So that's what's going on on the other side. Um, but what's already out there? If you would compare, now certainly more research has been done in gaming disorder, right? As you all know, it's like an off-discussed topic in child and adolescent psychiatry. So people are trying to draw parallels between compulsive sexual behavior disorder and gaming disorder, just to see um, how a relatability can be made and, you know, it just becomes easier to build off of, of another established set of diagnostic criteria. So persistent pattern, there's, I've, I've highlighted this, these things so that you can draw your attention to these, you know, just these phrases, which uh, are the main points in that diagnostic criteria. So failure to control, uh, intense repetitive sexual impulses. The next thing is the central, that thing, the symptoms um, the sexual activities become the central focus. For gaming disorder, you, you give increasing priority to gaming to the extent that it just takes precedence over every aspect of your life. Now, the third thing for any addiction-related problem, even if it's substance use, is the fact that you've made numerous attempts unsuccessfully to quit or to reduce and just you know haven't been able to. And uh, the, the corollary to that in the gaming disorder world is continuation or escalation of gaming. Um, and of course, the final point is about significant impairment in personal, occupational, education, and other areas of functions. Just for you to know that these are the parallels that exist out there in the world. ICD is 11 criteria for CSBD and drawing parallels from the case vignette, like just the word cloud that we just did, right? Um, you guys, you guys came up with a lot of uh, important stuff. You said continued patterns of behaviors. I know that you, you most definitely said that strong sexual urges and preoccupations. You mentioned that it became more explicit, and treatment four times. Somebody said there was lack of therapeutic support, etc. So that translates into, you know, treatment failures basically. Um, and then somebody said over more than twenty years, which was obviously, you know, this guy has been going on twenty six years. So. I uh, just wanted to show you how you lined up uh, with things to have been identified from the case. All right, so Dr. Potenza in the same article along with his team has proposed four criteria for pornography use disorder, again, which centers on impaired control, increasing priority, continuation or escalation, and then behavioral pattern of sufficient severity resulting in significant impairment, just something to be aware about. So what are the risk factors for developing this kind of uh, behavioral issue. Uh, motives for using pornography, past negative life. So, you know, the motivations obviously are stress re reduction, emotional regulation, compensation, uh, unfulfilled sexual fantasies in real life, past ne negative life events or trauma, sexual abuse and PTSD is a risk factor, attachment style, which is insecure or attachment anxiety and attachment avoidance and sexual excitability. Certainly if you have a high trait sexual motivation or an arousal in response to pornographic stimuli, people are different all over. So these are the risk factors that have been identified so far. Now, what are the clinical manifestations and impacts? Certainly, I, I didn't know this. It could lead to erectile dysfunction, um, psychosexual dysfaction, dissatisfaction, certainly because you become more critical of one's or one's partner's bodies. Um, also, there is more performance pressure and less actual sex, and then leading to more risky behaviors like having more sexual partners and engaging in paid sex behavior. Um, obviously, um, there's high secrecy, like somebody also mentioned in that word cloud. Comorbidity, like I was mentioning before, we said ADHD, depression, OCD, et cetera. Um, this you know, has been associated with anxiety, mood disorders, substance use, and sexual dysfunction. Also with smoking, drinking alcohol or coffee, substance use, and problematic video game use, which sometimes occurs simultaneously. Um, so what has COVID-19's pandemic done to this problem? Here, um, social distancing happened, obviously. It led to limited possibilities for casual sex. Triple A's engine model, which I was describing to you guys about having impaired control, and and I, you know, it was on a previous slide. But there is this model uh, which COVID nineteen pandemic certainly has brought to the fore. 
Um, there are variabilities in laws around the world. Obviously, as you can imagine, the cultural context in which these things are done is different in India versus different in Europe and different in America. Uh, there are different laws too with accessing this content online, but with COVID-19 pandemic, the VPNs became more and more prevalent and people started finding ways around the problem to access more of this material online, given the lockdown and the peak of the pandemic with people thrown out of work and just having so much free time on their hands. Eroticization of fear um, is also, you know, you should, if you have some time, maybe read about it if you're interested. Um, then moral incongruence, just the whole idea of the religious beliefs that people have and whether or not this is okay and whether or not, you know, with people having more time on their hands and having access to all of this material certainly brings up the problem of moral incongruence, especially in the context of religious uh, beliefs and family, family values. Um, and escapism from the world of reality, certainly switch yourself off and engage in these things for long periods of time. And finally, there's some underlying psychopathology. And if there is underlying psychopathology to begin with, uh, it leads to, there is a correlation with increased porn consumption, which was shown to have come out uh, from the research of, during covid 19s pandemic. Now, this is a graph that we had created just to show you guys what happened in different countries across the world. Um, this is something that shows you the peak increase in the traffic compared to an average day on the on the y-axis and different countries on the x-axis so that it shows you the dates on which the peak was reached on Pornhub and the date on which at which the lockdown started so you can compare the different countries against each other just to know not only is there a variability by the way population is not taken into consideration here I mean there's no need for population that has been controlled so you can see which countries were doing poorly especially during the peak of the peak of the pandemic and when the lockdown started. Now, um, what are the various assessment tools that are out there? Um, I know of these are the ones that I could research and put together for you on the slide just for the sake of awareness. Um, it, it focuses on different domains of the problem. Uh, just for you to know, there is a sexual addiction screening test. And by the way, all of these scales are of different lengths. Some of them are self-administered, some of them are physician-administered. If you have some time certainly and you're interested or wish to know, you can go further into this. So compulsive sexual behavior inventory, there is a hypersexual disorder secret, uh, screening inventory. And the internet sex screening test, I think, is a very small one, which assesses five distinct dimensions like online sexual compulsivity, sexual uh, behavior, which is social, online sexual behavior, which is isolated, and then online sexual spending and interest in behavior. Uh, there are 25 dichotomic questions, so you could basically just screen people real quick with using this. There's another one. There's, there's four more of these, uh, which are out here. Um, so I'll, I'll go past this now to the next thing. So let's move on to the management. People recognize that there have been small studies with small sample sizes. That's usually always the problem. Clinical controls have been lacking just for obvious reasons. Research methods are totally scattered and unverifiable and not replicable. But still people given whatever knowledge there is, researchers are recommending a multimodal treatment approach deploying different disciplines of pharmacology, psychotherapy and family counseling simultaneously or, or sequentially. One thing to know is there's this program which is rather innovative. It's called Restart. Um, it is an addiction, an internet addiction recovery program in Fall City in Washington State. Uh, it is an inpatient recovery program that integrates technology de detoxification. Um, there is no technology allowed for 45 to 90 days, much like a drug or alcohol treatment program. A 12 step work, CBT, experiential adventure based therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and brain enhancing interventions, animal assisted therapy. There's motivational interviewing and mindfulness based relapse prevention. So, this is like the one program I found in the country that had all of these multimodal approaches just put together in one place, like a rehab. Um, so psychotherapeutic approaches, of course, there's motivational interviewing, just like there is for substance use disorders. Um, there's family therapy that's recommended, reality therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy. Drugs-wise, SSRIs have been used because comorbid psychiatric conditions or symptoms exist, right? Dep depression and anxiety. Of them, escitalopram uh, has been studied and it showed there is a decrease, significant decrease in the mean uh, hours of internet usage. And then bupropion also decreased craving for internet uh, video game play, total game, game play time. So there are different drugs that have been studied and found to show some evidence. These are the ones that I put up for you, which have shown something in the literature. 
Um, now, methylphenidate also could be a potential treatment. Uh, mood stabilizers have some role, but not well defined. And then the combination, the escitalopram and the citalopram uh, seroquel combination and naltrexone, especially for pornography, is very useful. And finally, physical exercise also compensates for low dopamine levels because dopamine is so intrinsically linked to this problem. What did this guy do? What did our Mr. Jones do? He entered mindfulness-based therapy. He had all of, by the way, there are weekly meetings, like the 12 step, it's called the Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, SLAA meetings, just like we have Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous, the SLAA is the counterpart for this, this problem. Um, build, building a relationship with a sponsor and there's in, installing internet accountability software into digital devices for one year. There is a creation of an abstinence list healthy boundary promoting behaviors, and then something, a technique, which is called stop, observe, breathe, expand, and respond, breathing and guided meditation. So that's what happened with Mr. Jones. Now, how do we prevent and reduce harm in the post pandemic era, right? One thing to consider is there will be readaptation adaptation difficulties because people will have difficulty coping with dependence on some of these activities, certainly as we get out of the pandemic. There has been a rise of coronavirus porn. Seriously, like people start Googling coronavirus porn. It's a thing, it's a new genre of pornography. I haven't, I haven't searched it. Um, there is a normalization of violence against women. Uh, you know, just the expectations changing uh, around treatment of people, the bodies and whatever, you know, novelty that people want to engage in. Um, and then limited evidence certainly, right? So where do you go with all of these problems too. You will always, you will still have limited evidence in this era, in this area of research and there'll be less targeted interventions. So with that, we had this in mind. So a few of my colleagues and I put together this paper and we published it in the Frontiers in Psychiatry. It came out 10 days ago. If you're interested, try to take a look. There are some um, useful tips and, and things that people can do to just give patients some guidance, um, like this slide, for example which will tell you generally and specifically what can be done to tackle a problem like this. So among the various things, and we tried to build this uh, on uh, some, some other papers, recommendations for broadly internet related addictions. We were specifying this just for pornography use. So scheduling daily time for physical activity, engaging in vocational activities like reading, et cetera. And these might seem to be a little underrated and not scientific, etc. But that's usually because we underestimate the value of this stuff. This is literally what is out there and might be helpful to propose as solutions for people really impaired by these problems. Intentionally limiting daily screen time outside work related activities, keeping touch with friends. Now, specifically, I want to go over this. What we proposed was creating an abstinence list, right? Detailing the specific problem behaviors, because then people become really aware of what they're doing, when they're doing and how they're doing focusing on mindfulness exercises, actively building trust with closest members in the family, especially significant other transparency, and then installing internet accountability software on digital devices and seeking out programs that may support individual recovery and foster a sense of accountability like the meeting. So this is just based on Mr. Jones's case, we put together some specific stuff that people could, patients could use and even providers could uh, propose to their patients for, for doing. Um, now, this would be the presentation is not going to be complete if I didn't mention to you guys what about the consumption of illegal content online with whatever the pandemic has done um, and whatever increase in pornography use there has been certainly there is it's come to a point of increasing um, child sexual abuse material. This is a term CSAM, which was previously known as child pornography. What I found through my literature search was that there is a program. It is called prevented. So it's an online internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy. It's very ironical that the internet is the problem and also the solution. So the fact that, but one thing is good about this thing that I, I read, I read a little bit about it. It says, uh, you know, there is anonymous uh, recruitment of participants. You just register, it's advertised through uh, different modes on the internet. Uh, assessment is only through text chat in a very anonymized format. And I don't know about the whole regulations of wanting to or having to report illegal consumption, especially if it relates to children. It was not explicitly mentioned in the article that I read. So there's more to know about it. Re randomization and pre-measurement of the problem 
So people were randomized into psychological placebo and the CBT arm, and there are eight modules which are done for one hour every week, I think, and there's a post measurement and follow up measurement. So, so far, this has been generating some really good results, especially with people struggling with this specific problem of excessive viewing of child sexual abuse material. With that, I come to the end of this presentation. 2020 certainly has taught us a lot of things. And when I do say, I don't know, I just found Charles Dickens's quote being very apt for this, uh, this situation. I'm still gonna say that it was, you know, some good things came out of it. We realized how the economy could be run in a completely different format. There was so many things that we had to learn from it, but certainly there are uh, paradoxes that 2020 has brought to us. And, and a lot of things have uh, become known a lot of invaluable lessons imparted. Um, thank you so much for your attention, for your time, for having me here. And I'll just open it up for questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Veroni. That was a truly riveting lecture. And um, I know that a lot of um, our students were really looking forward to that lecture today. Um, I'm just going to switch up our view a little bit first. So um, if anybody wants to jump in with any questions, feel free. Yeah, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Oh, awesome. Okay. I just had a question. How much of an influence do you think the uh, uh, is more generational? Like um, past generations grew up on movies like American Pie or The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman. Current generations are growing up in the music industry with Cardi B singing songs like WAP. So I'm just wondering how much of an influence do you think that plays in these kind of disorders and what could we do to combat those kind of things? Yeah, that's Ryan, that's a great question. I'm trying to think back about what, what all I read about this particular point that you bring up. I think there was mention about the fact that first there was difficulty in access. One thing is obviously difficulty in access, right? We all recognize that this material was available through magazines and through more, um, you know, not less, less obvious sources, I would say. And now everything is just out there and everything is so easily accessible. I don't, I don't know if the literature necessarily said that there is one way or another to go about curtailing use or regulating something. It, there's not even, there's no, like I've read so extensively on this topic. I don't think that it pointed out to any mention of a forward direction of whether we should curb use or whether, like it's it's not like the, it's not like obvious, like, you know, like cigarettes or e-cigarettes or something that has very demonstrable damage. So although people recognize in the literature that it has been a generational problem, certainly on the grounds of access and on the grounds of access on um, acceptability, I would say. Everything has become a whole lot more acceptable and out there in the open than it was in the past. But there is no movement in the direction of suggesting, oh, this is damaging, this is obviously harmful and therefore this should be curbed, et cetera. So that's the best I can answer you with, like from what I know. I hear it's a tough problem. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, it's regarding cultural and religious um, norms and shame. If someone were to approach you about um, these sort of issues and they they're fearful of seeking you know, some guidance or help, what, what would you advise them to do? So on a very personal level, and I've had actually a couple of patients like that. In fact, so a couple of them were explicitly, definitely my patient. Um, others were even like informally, you know, when somebody knows you're a psychiatrist, they tell you all kinds of things. Uh, so, so that also came up. Um, confidentiality and anonymity is obviously, you know, at the core of our profession. Uh, one thing is, I was, I can only tell you that I was told that problem more explicitly, maybe because I related to that particular person culturally. It may not even have been discussed with me in the first place if I didn't sort of come from that background. Um, so when patients know that there is that level of comfort and that bias that they have in their own heads they're more likely to discuss it with you in ways in different languages that you that they think that you will understand and relate to um what i would do for this and if it is you know in that cultural context a completely non-acceptable thing 
I'm certainly not going to discuss it with anybody, even if it's like a teenager or, you know, where would this problem come to be in late teenage, et cetera. You wouldn't, you're unlikely to see this come up with like eight year olds, nine year olds, et cetera. So having known that the person is capable of making decisions for themselves, at least in this area, um, I'm very unlikely to discuss it with anybody who's a guardian, even somebody who's a spouse, um, because, you know, unless there is danger, explicit kind of danger, to a spouse or somebody out there in the open by torts law, I'm not even mandated to report it to anybody or talk about it. So I'm not going to. I just give them the help and, and that'll be all. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, thank you again for the talk. Uh, just a question about like these patients, given how normalized like internet use is, especially with the younger generations, do when these patients come in, do they have the insight that uh, this is an addiction problem that's from my internet use? That is a fantastic question. I'm sorry, I don't see your name. Um, but yeah, great question. Uh, so first of all, I've had all of two patients discuss this with me, okay? So uh, it's not that frequent that people come up. Um, especially it's a little bit uncomfortable, I guess, for some veterans in the hospital to discuss the problem with a woman. So that kind of layer also is 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 in here. Um, but uh, insight, insight wise, the only thing is I think that people come up to me with when they are significantly impaired by the problem. When they realize that they're spending inordinate amounts of time doing justice and nothing else. And something else is falling apart in some other sphere of their life. And they think that maybe there's a connection, maybe. They don't necessarily think it's an addiction related issue, okay? They're just there maybe discussing what could be a potential psychiatric problem. They don't call it an addiction. They just say, um, yeah, I, I just seem to spend a lot of time doing this every day and I just can't seem to stop. And then it is up to me to take them in that direction of saying, well, a lot of addictions are precisely this. You have made unsuccessful attempts to stop. You don't stop. You have just increased your use. Like one cigarette can become 20 cigarettes over the course of time. This is something similar. So if I want to draw parallels, I use what I've learned in this, you know, through this literature research and try to educate them about it, which is what I did actually. Except I didn't have like a whole lot in my in, in our arsenal to even say, okay, this needs to be done. Because of course, you're always uh, constrained by space and resources. Like whoever said that SLAA meetings were easily accessible. Whoever said that in the, you know, like, even if I do define it for them as this could be an addiction related issue, what next? But certainly I do try to draw parallels to create, to give them, lend them a little bit of that insight if they're willing and accepting of that issue, just because we know what is out there a little bit. Usually they have no insight about it. I actually had a question, Dr. Veroni, about what do you think like accounts for that lag that the U.S. Um, exhibits compared to like other parts of the world, compared to Europe uh, when it comes to just research in PUI? I find that really surprising, actually, that there is such I, a lag. I also found that extremely surprising. I I don't know. I could have my personal opinion about this. More like there's nothing else. There's no way else I can answer this question other than what my own hypotheses for the. I just think that certain parts of the US certainly are more liberal than certain areas of the world where this research is predominantly being conducted. Think about it. Like if you knew who the members, member countries of the cost were or the driving nations behind uh, the ICD-11 diagnostic criteria being established, like where all their researchers are hearing from, you would know that that level of acceptability perhaps in those other countries is not as high as it is in the US. Besides. The whole idea of the US not wanting to pathologize something that is so inherently a part of human nature. Um, I, I think that, and, and also the fact that, listen, like it, this is a lot of this is highly political. The APA puts out stuff, it is pretty much where the DSM 5 comes from, right? It's the APA that, that does this. Um, the DSM 5 goes through numerous text revisions. There are so many, um, it takes a while 
it takes a while and it's not necessarily and i don't want to get into any controversy by saying any of this stuff it could just be my personal opinion right i may not even be basing basing it on knowledge or hard facts just the fact that of course they would do their best to build it off of numbers and hard research and things like that but as we know in our reading of the dsm2 right a lot of it is purely subjective um so i think that accounts a little bit for that difference also maximum of the research i don't know for some reason is just done in like other european countries you will find a wealth of literature coming out from this whole task force there's like a whole group in behavioral addictions in some other countries there is a lot of movement in this area like dr kutenza is doing stuff at yale university i don't know where else in the us they're doing work on this but that movement is nearly not as large in numbers even compared to in the Euro- european countries which i think is more of a cultural unacceptability than anything else that actually makes a lot of sense cuz um going back to what you touched on like there's a lot of research on this being done in like japan and korea um because there is that like cultural kind of stigma against some um, kind of being like a deadbeat so to speak you know being in your home and just being on the internet all the time so that's that's actually a really interesting point yeah now i can i can tell you that india is not really doing research in this area although the <laughs> although the slide that we created here was showing that country having the most amount of the maximum usage among all the countries but just not happening here yeah. If nobody else had a question, um, I guess I'll jump in again. I was kind of wondering about the uh, basis for the erectile dysfunction. Is that like what is the biological basis of that? Um, as the old adage goes, like use it or lose it. This is kind of the opposite of that. So, what was kind of the basis for that? I'm curious. That's a very good question. I actually read this theory somewhere. There's this paper. Hold on. Let me uh, bring this to you. There is this paper. It's very extensive. Here it says. Um, uh one study 60% of patients who suffered sexual dysfunction with one re- uh, with one real pa- partner characteristically did not have this problem with pornography and some argue that the causation between pornography use and sexual dysfunction is difficult to establish since true controls are not exposed to pornography um uh, true controls not exposed to pornography are rare to find and have proposed possible research design in this regard actually you know what i didn't end up answering your question because it literally says we don't know why but we've seen this association there's this paper it's written by uh, alarcon in the journal of clinical medicine um i'm going to put the link in the chat box for you this is where i picked it up from i wanted to make sure that i gave this information as a clinical impact of the problem but that's why the paper this is the source which doesn't explain why there is but all it says is there's a correlation Yeah, I read somewhere that it had something to do with reality versus expectations. Like porn nowadays is a lot more hardcore than it used to be in the past. So these individuals tend to have um higher expectations compared to reality. And so then they have issues maintaining or achieving erection because of that. Yeah, that's that's also what they said in some in that half sentence there, right? They had the problem with the partner but not so much with pornography. So that makes a lot of sense, right? And I think that that would be a very clever hypothesis for this. Um I was also going to mention that um I'm I'm at a urology resident and they're actually um doing some research on this topic as well just to see you know if there's any physical you know components to it yeah and did they come up with like erectile dysfunction as being one of the impacts um well i guess he was telling me about how sometimes um you know f- friction and actually the physical aspect of it if you're i mean if you're looking at porn you know 3 to 4 times a day and you're doing that consistently so they're trying to figure out if there's any correlation or you know if it could be destructive to the yeah. anatomy so yeah wow okay i didn't think that far out in yeah wow that would be illuminating research if they publish it i also wanted to mention kind of on the i guess the other side of it it's it's sad to see that the uh, the normalization of violence against women that that's a thing i've read about that before during covid that mm-hmm. that is um increasingly becoming alarming 
today with the pandemic and everything that's going on. It's just um, kind of disheartening to see. It's, it's just that people will not necessarily or just responsibly draw that connection back to escalating por pornography use, right? Which is what the whole point of doing like my, you know, I, I usually try to do research on topics which I, I feel like have a social or political sort of impact. My, my MPH was in administration and policy. So things related to policy issues certainly just catch my attention. Um, but when people don't reasonably draw back that connection to a behavior, that is overall negatively impacting society as a whole. Uh, I think there's work to be done in this space. Definitely. Okay, well, um, I'd just like to ask if anybody has any more questions for Dr. Barani. Okay, all right, if we're all covered, I just wanted to thank you once again, Dr. Barani, for the incredibly illuminating lecture. Um, I think I can speak for everyone that it was incredibly enjoyable, um, very educational, and I think it's going to be very relevant for us as um, young future psychiatrists uh, forging forward. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you guys for having me. I hope that many of you, I mean, you're obviously interested in psychiatry, which is why I'm sitting here and, and uh, listening to this conference. So hopefully in the future, we can be colleagues, maybe even friends, who knows? We'll, we'll meet at some point. But thank you for having me. Thanks for your attention. I hope this was an enjoyable presentation. You learned something because I did. Absolutely. Right. Thank you so much, Barani, uh, Dr. Barani. Okay, have a nice day. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Bye people. I take care. All right, everyone, the time is 10:19 uh, a.m. EST. So um, our next session begins at 1040. So you guys can take a break till then. Um, you guys can start logging in before then if you wish. Um, but yes, uh, Dr. Avery is expected at 1040 a.m. EST. So um, take a breather. I'll see you back later. <laughs>